time. My name is Andy Crestadina, and we collaborated in the past on an agency growth playbook, which was focused on SEO and content strategy, which are really, really important factors in growing an agency. But we realized that there were some gaps and some opportunities to add a lot more value by covering some of those topics that we missed. I personally have used exactly these tactics to grow our firm here. Uh, my company is called Orbit Media Studios. It's a web design company here in Chicago. Uh, founded in April of 2001, and we have grown it to $7 million per year U.S. in revenue. And it's grown since our last videos. Uh, there are now 53 people here, and it's going very well. Uh, and the secret to it, one of the several secrets to it, is pipeline is demand, is creating a steady flow of incoming leads uh, through digital marketing uh, to avoid a lot of the problems and, and, and issues that come up inside agencies. Weird things happen when you don't have a steady pipeline of new incoming qualified leads, MQLs, marketing qualified leads. One of them is that, of course, cash flow, running out of business, you know, lack of demand. Another is that you don't have sufficient professional development opportunities to keep the highest performing team members interested. And another is that things get weird because when you're hungry, you entertain and pursue opportunities that don't fit into your model for high margin projects and retainers. Uh, people that don't have enough leads consider doing weird things. Uh, they go outside their comfort zone. They start making mistakes their customer service goes down, their margins go down uh, because they're just trying to capture anything that they can. So the key to staying focused on those uh, best service offerings, the key to keeping those best people on board, uh, the key to having a stable, a stable flow and not having to reduce your prices or discount things because uh, there aren't enough opportunities in front of you is demand is pipeline, is lead generation. And it's this course, it's this course that we're going to go into exactly these topics. So in the last course, we talked about content strategy and SEO. Absolutely critical, <laughs> very powerful, very effective uh, channels. Uh, we talked about account-based marketing, which is super efficient. It's highly aligned sales marketing uh, programs. Uh, and we also talked about digital content best practices, which are things that if you miss those, nothing else works. Uh, in this course, we're going to go into some things that we did not cover, but that are also key ingredients. Some things that are very uh, close to me uh, because it's been the focus of my career. Even though I've done 20 years of SEO and analytics and 16 years of content strategy and influencer marketing and blogging, I'm going to talk about conversions, not just the cheese, but the mousetrap, about how to get visitors to take action, and how we have done it on our site, the things that we do every day for our clients, I've been part of the planning process for more than a thousand websites. Uh, I'm daily inside uh, people's analytics accounts and in meetings where websites are being planned, where copies being written, where UX is being laid out. Uh, so we're gonna start there. We're gonna start at the bottom of the funnel. We're gonna start at the improvements that can make an impact because you have visitors on your website right now. How to maximize the value of the, your current traffic. Even if you do nothing related to SEO, even if you make no improvements to your content strategy, what I'm going to cover in the next 40 minutes uh, should have an impact for any of you because it is a, a way to get greater value, uh, more juice from every squeeze, more value from your current visitors. Uh, so we're going to start this three-part uh, agency growth playbook series uh, with the conversion strategy uh, let's jump in right now. One way to summarize digital marketing is all here on one slide. It's to bring a visitor from the traffic source to your thank you page. That's frequently how success is measured in analytics and more broadly. Just get the visitor on the website through the process, contact form, submission, thank you page. Right? This is Now they're in your CRM. Now you can follow up. Now you, they move from your marketing funnel into your sales funnel. Uh, so... Yes, very broadly, everything is here on this arrow. Uh, as you know, I'm an SEO, so I'm often bringing people from Google to a thank you page. But that's really the big picture. There's a lot in here, obviously. And one way to summarize it, and we've talked about this before, is that there's really two key success factors. There's traffic and there's the conversion rate. There's cheese and there's the mousetrap. 
there's search optimization, and there's conversion optimization. Now, I could easily make the case that conversion optimization should really be the starting point because if you think about demand and conversion as a chain, if there's a weak link in that chain, nothing else in the prior in the previous links matter. If the contact form doesn't convert visitors into leads because it's confusing or uh, there's friction or there's some issue with trust, that visitor is uh, is not taking action. It doesn't matter how much traffic you drive. If the conversion rate is zero, any number times zero is zero. So probably we should really begin at the end of the process and then go backwards to the beginning of the process. Because improvements to the end of this process, to com com improvements to the bottom of your funnel can drive return on investment and generate leads with no other changes to your marketing. Improvements to the website themselves are often durable changes that remain regardless of what else you do in any other channel. So it is, uh, I can, I, I strongly believe that we should fix the mousetrap before we make better cheese. I'm going to start with actually the contact page because uh, on a lot of sites, it's just sort of boring or ignored or missed. And there might be opportunities right there. There might be people on your contact page right now. Here's an example of a contact page. It's perfectly fine. Uh, this is a, a lead generation site for a tech company. Nothing wrong with it. And it's got a little bit of text at the top that actually isn't bad. It's very small text, not that likely to be read, but take a look. Tens of thousands of people, that sounds good, use our products every day. If you're considering moving to the cloud, we're here to help. Okay, there's some opportunities there because use our products, that's kind of not very specific. And you know, is this company gonna contact me back anyway? Here's an example of how we redesigned that page. Get a quick demo, ah, sounds more valuable. And then read the text. You're about to learn how, how many? 20,000 consumer packaged goods professionals manage what? 10 billion in trade spend. Just share a little bit about yourself and we'll be in touch when? Within 24 hours. Wow, that sounds much more specific. And by the way, the person you might talk to, she's right there, that's Shelly. And by the way, is this company legitimate? Have they done it for others? Yes, they're the logos right there. Bottom of funnel improvements to the end of the process, not very expensive, can make a big difference. Testable. Specificity. Instead of just tens of thousands of people, we're saying 20,000 consumer packaged goods pros, right? If I'm one of them, I see myself in it, use our products every day. How? They manage this amount of money in trade spend. They can't wait to talk to you. No, talk to Shelly. It's not just them. It, it's a specific person. And you'll be hearing from us soon turns into, we'll be in touch within 24 hours. Committing to a response time. It's important to, to think about this. The contact forms are sort of inherently unsatisfying. Do you know if that company is going to get back to you? There's a percentage of form submissions for which the brand never responds. If the if the, the visitor knows that, they may feel like they've got to submit to several websites just to make sure that they get someone to respond. Therefore, uh, committing to a time, the person is more likely to close the tab and not go back to Google and quit searching because they feel like they got their job done. So specificity correlates with conversion. In these slides, which we'll be sharing there, I've got some layouts or just pause the video here and you can see these are elements that may work to improve the conversion rate of your contact page. I have more of these for you. Stay tuned. If that made a difference for you, if you're measuring it in the new version of Google Analytics, GA4, uh, it will show up here in a path exploration for uh, with the, the, the page title as the starting node as the, we're just showing the contact page. In other words, you can see the percentage of people who went from that page to the thank you page just by using a path exploration. If you made an improvement to that page, this is where the impact will be measured. And measurement is what we should be doing here. Uh, the worst thing to do when you're making marketing decisions is to just trust your gut and do what you think sounds best. It's your opinion. Make the change and don't check. You've got, your, you've got an opinion, I've got an opinion, but we're each just data sets of one. So opinion and personal preference is not the best way to make a marketing decision. Uh, far better to follow industry best practices. But those aren't ideal either because that's just what worked for other people and what worked in the past. So uh, the goal is not to follow best practices, it's to make an impact. So far better is to consider every idea you have is in fact just a hypothesis. Go take the action and measure the impact. I'm speaking to you as, a, as an agency founder and a person who works with clients. If you're uh, providing creative services and digital marketing services and you work with clients, I highly recommend that you that you uh, 
bring this framework and thinking to your meetings and point out to people that every marketing idea is in fact just a hypothesis. It's a way to have better meetings. It's a way to manage your clients. It's a way to, uh, to, to, to have a conversation about it that's open without just you know bias and opinion. Uh, ultimately, of course, the A-B test would be the ultimate way to do that. We're running A-B tests all the time, running one right now, uh, and, and to be able to see, you know, excluding, excluding time as a variable, you can see, you know, which of these things had uh, the higher conversion or click-through rates. Okay, again, best practices are really just good hypotheses. Take that to heart. Embrace that. Burn that into your brain. Best practices are really just good hypotheses. That's the proper way to think about it, digital marketing. There's lots of things that worked very, very well that did not align with best practices. Most of what I'm saying, everything of what I'm saying today is best practices. Go test it for yourself. Calls to action. This is really important. Why do people click? Why do people click on things? Stop and think about that for a minute. You may end up concluding in the end that really people click on things when they've done a split-second cost-benefit calculation and concluded that the benefit exceeds the cost. That's when people click or tap anywhere. Inboxes, search results pages, social streams, right? That, that's why you take action, right? That's why all of us as website visitors and people within a digital experience actually uh, move forward through a process and downwards through a funnel is because the next action in our, in our mind, the, the perceived benefits exceeded the perceived cost. That's how we get this little person over to the right. In other words, your job writing a call to action is to manipulate in their mind the, the return on the investment. Make the return high and the investment small, and you'll improve your click-through rates. So instead of just saying, do this thing, tell them they're doing something valuable. Do this valuable thing. Or better yet, do this easy thing, right? Reduce the perceived commitment. These are ways to improve click-through rates. So uh, one way to think about this, contact us is not really a call to action. It's not. It's not a strong verb. Contact. It's a good way to look at websites or look at pages or look at anything. What is the verb being used here? Contact, read, learn, click. These are vague. They're common to every page. They're not specific enough. They're not, they're not manipulating the cost-benefit calculation in the mind of the visitor. Apply for a social media audit. Ooh, sounds valuable. Sounds like they're busy. Sounds like they might not even accept me. That sounds like a, like a good offer. Or schedule a call with a social strategist. You're not spending money yet. Just schedule a call. It's not a high commitment, right? Just find a little time on the calendar and we'll be in touch within 24 hours. You can tell. I'm, I'm closing the uncertainty gap. I'm telling you when we'll be in touch. We've also uh, found that, uh, and eye tracking study would show this, faces near calls to action improve the visual prominence of that part of the page. You saw the, the face on the other, on the, other uh, th the contact page a minute ago. That's the idea. It humanizes a site and it improves the visual prominence because faces are a magnetic type of imagery, which we discussed uh, in the last uh, course, which was about, you know, digital content best practices. If that worked for you, yes, I'm a data-driven data marketer. If that worked for you, then uh, it will show up in, in the same report. In the path exploration report, you can see the click-through rate for any call to action from any page. Simply go to the path exploration, choose the starting, the, the uh, page title or page path as the starting point. Put, drop the node in there, choose the page that you're measuring, and then see the percentage. You can calculate the percentage of people who clicked on any call to action. Very powerful. Marketers should generally know the, the click-through rates on their calls to action. Uh, that's your benchmark. Now your job is to go beat the benchmark, right? There's no good or bad click-through rate. Your job is just to beat yesterday. It's something like that. Next, we need a structure of a website that aligns with keywords so that we can do what we talked about last time, right, in, in, uh, to have an SEO strategy. But this isn't an SEO strategy for content marketing to make our, to make our articles rank for information intent queries. This is, a content this is a conversion strategy for our services, our sales pages, our, our service pages, which, which we want to rank for the commercial intent key phrases. These are phrases that generate demand, right? I love getting visitors to my articles but I need to get visitors to my uh, service pages. So if you've got a service page that's just called our services and it's a little bit of everything, that page is not going to perform well because it's not specific enough. Remember, specificity is going to correlate with results. Again, if your specificity is going to correlate with traffic, if you've got a page that's just generally about all of your services, that's a problem. Really, there's three types of key phrases which we've discussed in the past. 
and three set and and um, uh, three types of visitor intent. No, do, go. Information intent, commercial intent, and navigation intent. I just collapsed the transactional and commercial intent into one category here. You'll notice in SEMrush, and we'll talk about this more later. The uh, the reports in SEMrush will actually show four types of intent. Uh, commercial and transaction intent are similar, so I'm just going to simplify it for us here, and say that there's really uh, three types, and they align with the three stages in the funnel that visitors problem aware, or they're problem and solution aware, or they're already problem solution and brand aware. They already know about you. They're just trying to get to your website. Navigational queries are people just trying to get to a website. Examples. What's a good click through rate for a Facebook ad? I don't know. Good question. That person just wants an answer. They're maybe trying to do it themselves. They might be a competitor or a different agency. Paid social ad management. That's a commercial intent key phrase. The person is trying to get a service, right? You wouldn't search for that unless you wanted a company or person to help you with ad management. Promote Plus. It's a brand. It's a company. That's a the, uh, That person already knows about you. They're just trying to get to the website. SEO is not mostly about the branded navigational queries. Uh, but we know from research that really 80% of all queries are for information intent uh, phrases, right? The no key phrases, which is why all that content marketing stuff we talked about in the last course is so relevant. Go back and look if you haven't uh, taken that course yet. And here is the report in SEMrush. Put anything into the keyword magic tool and it will show you in that first column the intent. Very useful, <laughs> right? Uh, blogs and content marketing programs typically target information intent queries. Sales and service pages typically target the commercial intent queries. Uh, you get the idea. And scanning through, it's a, it's a skill of a content strategist to be able to scan through any list of keywords and quickly identify, does that keyword have information or commercial intent? Align key phrases with intent, align pages with phrases. That's how we build a search optimized site structure. One of the main reasons why sites don't perform in search is because they don't really have a page on the topic. Maybe you've had this experience, right? In a meeting internally or talking to a client. Someone says, why don't we rank for that phrase? And then if you just simply ask, which page on our site's the best page for that phrase? Oh, I guess we don't really have a page about that topic. It's sort of mentioned on this other page. No, insufficient. We need a page focused on each topic, right? So that leads us to this idea of the search optimized site map. Different pages target different phrases. Not every page is a keyword opportunity. Right? Like the about page, what does that rank for? It's not really a search optimized page typically, right? I guess it's relevant for the brand, but the homepage is even more relevant for the brand. You know, navigation and tech queries, not really SEO. But the service pages, a well-built site has a, a section uh, of services, a page per service, a key phrase for each of those pages. Even if the key phrase seems out of reach, right? Even if the keyword difficulty is too high for us here and our page authority score doesn't seem sufficient, I would still optimize it anyway because, uh, you know, there are a, a page optimized for one phrase. If it's optimized well, will also be optimized for many closely related phrases. There will still be a trickle of traffic to that very likely. Uh, we'll soon get into how to optimize these pages and you'll see me. I'm going to use AI uh, to better optimize these pages. It's fun. By the way, down here at the bottom, uh, you'll see, okay, navigational queries. That's the home page. Commercial intent query, also the home page. The home page can target the most competitive commercial intent query. It's the page with the highest page authority score. That's why home is the worst home page, is the worst title tag for any home page. Uh, you have not opti optimized the home page at all if your home page title tag says home. It's a rookie mistake. It's embarrassing. You look like, uh, like you don't know what you're doing. A unicorn cries every time someone makes home their home page title tag. The homepage title tag is probably the single most important piece of SEO real estate on your website. Now, those deeper interior pages, the service pages are optimized for different other commercial intent queries, the specific phrases, the specific services. And then, in, of course, your blog is where you are up targeting all the information intent queries. And then the off-nav pages, the pages that aren't in your main navigation, you can make dozens or hundreds of them, right? Well, we call them fishing net pages. They're pages that can be optimized for lot, for other phrases. Uh, just because you're targeting a key phrase on a web page does not mean that web page has to appear in your main navigation. These are independent considerations, UX and SEO. Target a phrase without making a page and putting it in your main nav. That's totally reasonable, right? Most pages that rank on most websites are not in the main navigation. So keep in mind those commercial intent phrases. Now I'm going to line these up with intent. Go, do, do, no, do. Make sense? 
you're feeling it. I get it. You got it. Okay. Now, uh, as a metaphor, I sometimes say that these search optimized pages are like sails on a boat, but there's no limit to the number of sails you can put on this boat. Each page has the chance to catch traffic like a sail catches wind, right? Email and social, perfectly valid form, uh, sources of, of traffic for a, you know, a, a content strategy or a, you know, a brand. But those are those are things that are activity based. You have to keep working at PPC or cost per click, or, you know, paid social, anything like that. Paid is something where you got to put in more resources all the time. So those are uh, it's a really a resource based thing. You stop putting gas in that tank, the motor stops. And then of course branding, like direct traffic, like there's lots of companies that just have they're just famous brands, as we'll see. Now, when this works well, uh, uh, it's a it's a, a a powerful source of traffic. I've got an example. It's a actually an article, but this is a recent um, key phrase that I targeted, how to make an about page, just a search optimized page. Uh, it currently ranks number four. This is what traffic looks like to a well-optimized page in GA4. The email, spike in traffic, social, uh, tail of traffic, search, long tail of traffic, right? Um, now, that report to make that in GA4, let me, let me walk through that for you briefly here. I've got a screencast here that shows you how I did that. Go to Explorations, click on Blank Exploration. Like I think of it like adding paints to the palette. Uh, you have to just first choose the variables you want. So I'm going to just add that first dimension. Then I'm going to add that metric. Um, if I were to create a filter in here to only see search traffic to a URL, I would have added session medium as another dimension. Now you can just drag them or click them to come into these metrics and sessions. Uh, the the metric becomes the value and the session becomes the row. Actually, when I switch to the um, uh, oh the filter is where I see just that specific URL. I'm going to make it so it exactly matches that uh, that's that that article. Uh, the URL in this case, I think it was like about page best practices. I can copy and paste it from the article. It'll find it there. Uh, now, as I scroll up here, you'll see me switch to the um, the line chart visualization which turns page path into the, actually a breakdown. Uh, choose the date range. Just happy to include this so you can see. I think that's a very useful thing. A lot of people are frustrated with GA4 because it's different. Well, this is how you kind of make it the same. This is how you get to that data. Okay. Really, we're focused on the money pages, I call them, right? It's the pages that are optimized for the dollar sign or euro sign key phrases. Uh, and and, and uh, I'm going to answer a really important question using data from a very, very famous researcher. Uh, I'm going to lean on um, Jacob Nielsen, uh, who is um, one of the co-founders of Nielsen Norman Group, NN Group, uh, and he answers this question, why don't website visitors take action? What are the causes of user failure? And he concludes in the end that the main reason people don't take action on websites is bindability, this missing information. That's a key insight. That's very valuable. And what we really want to do then is to just confirm, for the sake of our conversion rates, what information didn't we include? What do we need to put on this page? What does the visitor expect to find? Right. This is uh, going to help us convert people at a higher rate. In other words, I'm back to my arrows. We want to add clarity and reduce confusion. The key to doing that is to knowing the, the, our audience and knowing, like, think of it this way. There's a true story in the life of every visitor to every web page. What is the true story in the life of your visitor? We're going to get to that. We're going to make a little persona, just a web-based persona. We don't care much about, as agency people, we don't care that, you know, we're B2B, we're lead gen marketers, and we don't care too much about demographics or gender or age or income. We're mostly concerned about what are the buying signals? What are the triggers? What is the story in this person's life? And what are they hoping for? What are they afraid of? What do they like about finding help? What do they hate about shopping for our services? So if I'm targeting a VP of marketing because I'm selling you know, paid social media marketing services, I'm going to ask these questions to uh, people in my audience. Qualitative research, stakeholder interviews. We're going to do a series of interviews. We build websites. We do this every day. We do not know how to build a website until we do this. This is critical information. Without this, you're just sort of guessing or you're putting what you think they want to hear. You don't know for sure. I'm going to ask this question first of my, my uh, end user if I can, right? or our stakeholders there, uh, take me back to that moment when you first realized you needed help. What else did you try and what didn't you love about it? 
Starting out, what was the biggest problem you were hoping to solve? When evaluating options, what was the most important thing to you? Right? That's going to help me with prioritization. What can you do now or what can you do better that you couldn't do before? That might have listed a testimonial. And then I'm going to also interview the top prospects, right? I'm going to talk to if uh, my sales team, my frontline service providers. Uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to find out from the people who are always talking to prospects, the people who respond to these leads, what, they, what they're hearing. What questions, sales team, are you just sick and tired of answering? What should people ask you, but they rarely do? What is the aha moment that people have during our Zoom calls when we're explaining our services? What analogies do we use to describe our services? What is the biggest number that we can get up to when we're describing our work? You'll see how that, how that factors in in a second. And then fill in this blank. People can work with us even if what, right? What are the objections that we can overcome? People can work with us even if... Now, that even if, you're going to see me use that and some others as useful words and phrases. I'm going to use grammatical forms and sentence structures that will help me sell by triggering cognitive bias. This is conversion copywriting, of course, right? So because is a powerful word. We do weekly check-ins with our clients because you need to know what's working. Should You should have access to your, your real-time re performance reports. right? Make them feel empowered. They should have access to these reports. Already and still. You've already built up a following on Facebook, but you're still not getting engagement. Yeah, that's a power that's a common statement, right? Anytime you say already and still, you're aligning with the psychology of your audience. The fact is, or the truth is, the truth is most social media campaigns don't drive any donations, right? Maybe my target audience here is like a nonprofit. Uh, the fact is, people want to feel like they're rational decision makers. So when you write a sentence that includes that structure, you're aligning well with the psychology of your visitor. Even if you'll have on-demand support for your campaigns, even if you don't have a social pro in-house. Ah, yes, that's like a, you know, it, it, it's helping to address a concern, right? Anytime you write a sentence that has even if, uh, you, you begin to do objection handling, which is key, absolutely important, right? If you don't do objection handling on these pages, you can expect a lower conversion rate. Now, here's where the magic happens. Watch how I use this in copy. When evaluating options, my dear client, what was the most important thing to you? Fundraising was the top priority, then event promotion. Now I know how to build the page. Now I know the prioritization of the content. What was the biggest challenge you were hoping to solve, dear client? Oh, amplifying our, our annual giving campaigns was our key challenge. That's the most important thing. Uh, I'm going to use that grammatical form. You already have annual campaigns, but you're still not driving donations. Ah, oh, this page is reading my mind. You can just imagine how they feel like it aligns with them. What can you do now or can do better that you couldn't do before? Ah, oh, now I don't have to run that same report again and again. So tired of that. A regular cadence of reports for all stakeholders and executives. Oh, perfect. Right. That was something I was worried about, something I was hoping for. I knew. See, you see how this works? You know what their concerns are. Now you can, you can construct a page that sort of reads their mind and injects right into their field of vision the, ne the, next, the next biggest concern. It, the best sales pages emulate a sales conversation. What analogies do we use to explain what we do? Social media for events is like a photo album that lasts forever. It's like your family photo album. You should have these moments saved forever. You can go back and look at them, right? That, you can see it in your, in your streams, right? These are assets you can use again and again. What's the biggest number we can get up to? Oh, our average campaign reaches tens of thousands of people. Wow, our average campaign reached 20,000 plus community members. That's a powerful number. Numbers are persuasive. We're going to include that. This is all persuasion copywriting. What questions, sales team, are you sick and tired of answering? Answering. What if I want to cancel my contract? People keep asking me, what if I want to cancel? Read the contract. You can cancel any time. Oh, wow. The marketer realizes we didn't put that in our messaging. Put that near the call to action, right? That, that's going to address a big objection. So uh, we need to make sure that the page is aligned with their needs. That's a good example. What questions should people ask, but they don't? Right? The infrequently asked question. Uh, people never ask us about the impact of, on donations. People never ask us to project in advance what the outcomes would be. People just sort of hope it will work. Uh, but, but they should really ask us about actual results. The fact is, 
Most campaigns don't drive any donations. Wow, that's a really powerful statement. This person, you know, believes you're telling the truth when you put that in there. And it sounds like a data-driven answer. The fact is, okay. Now I'm going to use AI uh, to supplement this research. And I'm going to show you how to use ChatGPT, either the free version or the paid version, doesn't matter, uh, to get better results through, through uh, conversion copywriting by creating a synthetic version of your audience. It's like a, a, an artificial intelligent persona. Uh, so watch how I build this. This is perfect for the agency because once you have this persona built, you can talk to it on any time. So my prompt sounds like this. Build a persona for a job title, that's your buyer, of a $10 million, that's your, that's this, the, your ideal client profile, your ICP, nonprofit, the business category that we sell to. In, the, in a certain geography, and then what are their challenges? What do they do? What's the offer? Oh, that's their mission. They provide better access to healthcare resources. So I, presumably I'm selling uh, social media marketing services to a nonprofit, a healthcare nonprofit here. And my buyer is the marketing director. And the goal of this campaign is to create more effective fundraising and digi through digital marketing and to promote their annual events. I, now I know, right? I'm putting that in there. I'm going to ask it to write a persona that aligns with this person. This is ChatGPT. Uh, creating uh, a persona that I can then talk to and use to do better copywriting. I want to know not their demographics, their age, their gender, their income. I want to know their specific details about their goals, their pain points, and their decision criteria for hiring a company like mine. That's very useful. That's really powerful. That's going to help me do better copywriting, convert people at a higher rate, and build a better mousetrap. So the next thing it does is quite useful. It gives it a name, gives it a background, gives you the goals, the pain points, and the decision criteria. Wow, very, very useful. But this is just the beginning. I'm not a lazy prompter. I'm building up a chat where I can continue to talk to this. Now, I, you can take one of your existing pages and copy it in here. Literally ask the AI, which of this person's top concerns are not addressed on this web page? And as you go down the, th this list, it's going to basically tell you through this very quick gap analysis what you missed, what you could have said, what you didn't talk about, what, what they need to hear that you didn't say. Gold mine, powerful, fast. So uh, my hope is for all of you to convert visitors at a higher rate to get greater lead flow without greater traffic. And, and these are specific ways to do it. Qualitative research. AI-driven personas, which can then uh, help you with conversion copywriting. But we need to also support our claims with evidence. This is a common mistake. If your page doesn't add support, then you've made a lot of unsupported marketing claims. What we're really trying to do here is add evidence and reduce uncertainty. Because every claim you make in marketing that is not supported with evidence uh, weakens the message, right? It just genericizes your copy. It sounds like something anybody could have written. Very, very common. Here's an example of a web page, real web page, that makes a lot of claims. Spend less, make work easy, make you're gonna prosper. It's like a GPS, you're gonna know more, you're gonna feel great. Yeah, that actually, those are all unsupported marketing claims. Why? Because this page completely lacks evidence. There isn't one thing on here that shows me that somebody's ever used it, that somebody got value from it, that other people, um, you know, that it's highly reviewed or credible in any way. No, no, it's not hard because there's all kinds of different types of evidence you can add to a page. Our job here is to make sure we're not just making a bunch of unsupported claims. So there's testimonials, case studies, success stories, awards, years in business, size of our operation, the, you know, what are our products? How do we offer them? What are our, you know, happy clients and best sellers? This often, this sometimes appears at the top of a page, very close to the top, above the fold, right? This is for a, one of our clients, and you can see they're legit. That's a real business. Or the trust seals along the top, right? Very prominent position, right? Ha top of the visual hierarchy, adding evidence high on the page. Testimonials are a great way to do it. But there's a lot of missed opportunities on testimonials like this one. Feedback from our clients, the big text is vague, not specific to this company at all, right? The small text is uh, the actual testimonial, but it's actually boring and it's fake. Look, someone sent this to me because they stole my picture. This is a fake testimonial. Another problem I have with this is that the testimonial is not on the testimony, is not, on, not in the flow. It's not on the service page. 
It's separate. I don't love the testimonials page. Here's why. When you put all of your most powerful evidence on a separate page, you're taking important information and putting it outside the flow. You're expecting your visitor to go from the service page to click on testimonials, scroll down, find one that's relevant to their off to, to their concerns. And this is not that common for a visitor to do that. Far better to inject that evidence into their field of vision, put the testimonial next to the claim that it supports. Right? If you look at your analytics, you might find the testimonials page is maybe more like your 31st most popular page. That's not great, right? Why put it's like it's like, you know, instead of making a recipe with all the ingredients included, you've got a bunch of you've got, you know, all of your salt over there <laughs> on a, you know, on a separate dish. You're asking the visitor to put this stuff together. It doesn't make sense. Well, another problem with testimonials, people frequently make them as carousels. Uh, if you ever install a tool to check to see the click-through rate to subsequent slides on a carousel, you'll find it's likely very much lower than the scroll uh, percentage past that point, which proves instantly that you can improve the visibility of your subsequent testimonials by simply stacking them. This is an example of just where the big text is vague, doesn't really say anything. It's on a carousel, so the impactful testimonials are hidden until the visitor clicks. And the tiny text is actually the best part here. It's flipped, right? The top of the visual hierarchy should also be the most impactful messages. Ask that. Look at any page. Look at any depth on any page and ask, is the most impactful message here also the most visually prominent message? That's why I said put those trust seals high on the homepage. Ask if the most compelling content on your website is also the most visible content on your website. Those should be aligned. If your most visible thing is vague and boring and generic to millions of websites, and your most compelling thing is tiny and small and gray on white and toward the bottom, you've got a missed opportunity. The best testimonials actually answer questions, right? That's what the visitor's here for, to get the questions answered. And that subhead is actually specific. You can also upgrade the testimonial to a video format, which is the ultimate format for testimonials. And you can take an excerpt from it for the visitors who don't view it, and, you know, 80% of them won't. Uh, so they can get it at, at just as the text if they'd like. That is powerful uh, social proof. Also, a text-based testimonial has a special opportunity because you can put the target key phrase in there. This is a combination of cheese and mousetrap. A keyword-focused testimonial is a way to both increase search, search rankings and traffic and e increase conversion rates through social proof at the same time. And again, whenever possible, put the face. If you can't get permission and can't add the face and can't use the name, do it and it just add the testimonial anyway, but just maybe make it like, um, uh, you know, initials or whatever, the, whatever you can do to make it real, as real as possible. Research from SEMrush shows that testimonials can easily be converted into success stories that often have SEO impact. So success stories in this uh, example here, the data here is showing 1200% increase in organic keywords. It makes sense. That's they use the language that people are trying to find, right? It's, uh, it, it's, it's not that surprising, really. So these testimonials can be shared, LinkedIn, Facebook. They can be part of your, your local listing, business profile. They can be used on directory websites. And if you're part of the SEMrush Agency Profile Program, they can be put on that, pro on that profile. So uh, the success testimonials lead to success stories, which can also lead to traffic. That's just how hungry our audiences are for evidence of legitimacy. Two kinds of web pages. Some of them are just piles of unsupported marketing claims. Others are pages filled with evidence. If you fill your pages with evidence, you're going to get far better results. Just ask yourself, scroll down any page. How many unsupported marketing claims did you make on your home page, on any of your pages? Probably a lot. Very common for there to be a lot. We've actually done research on this and found that 28% oh, of home pages have evidence. The rest don't, right? We analyzed 500 websites, looked at 500 home pages, and found that only 28% had any evidence on the home page. Most of them are piles of unsupported marketing claims and just stacks of undifferentiated co copy. Here again, as promised, I'm showing examples of templates or mini wireframes that show the elements that we have found to be on high-performing pages. Um, you can take the screenshot out of the deck if you'd like, or just here it is on a, as a list. There's one of these I want to focus on a bit more, and I've touched on a bit already. The subhead, 
adding a meaningful subhead, it's a big difference. <laughs> it, it actually changes the flow. Here's an example. Our solutions, who wrote that? Why do they write that? What value does that offer? It doesn't actually say anything. You could just remove that and the page would be even better because it would pull up everything below it. The only people who use the word solutions are people who sell stuff. In 20 years of SEO, I've almost never seen the word solutions in any keyword research. The solutions is a long, vague word. The best words in marketing are short, specific words. So uh, a, a vague subhead that adds visual noise without adding value, there's always a better opportunity. What kind of solutions? What kind of services? What kind of outcomes? You know, For whom do we do this? Here's an example. Our products, our insights, our customers. You could do a better job of any of these, right? Our what? Baking and pastry products. What kind of ideas? New ideas from inside our bakery, right? Keyword relevance. Every vague subhead is a missed keyword opportunity. And by the way, the best, most compelling thing I found on this page was at the very, very bottom down here in this gray on white text, small, low on the page. It said, 100 years of quality baking ingredients. That should be the top thing. That's the best thing on this page. Again, it's like a game. Scan through any of your pages and ask, is the most compelling thing on this page also the most visually prominent thing on this page? If that worked for you, if that worked for you, you can measure this, you can optimize it, you can see it in GA4. Uh, here I am on the in the report section under pages and screens. There's the conversions. You can see the total number of conversions. By the way, uh, you could actually make a, uh, a filter to exclude uh, visitors who started their, their experience on a blog post. So all I've done is click on to add a filter, change the filter to exclude, and change landing page to be any value that contains blog. Uh, so there are uh, you know lots of URLs in this website that have blog in the in, in, in and so by taking those out, I get a better picture of my actual conversion rate of total conversions. Now let's move up. We're moving upwards through the funnel, the previous link in the chain. It's like another one of your home pages, the branded query SERP, the search results page when people search for your brand. What do they see? This is the beginning of their experience for a lot of visitors, right? What happens when they type in your brand here? If they type in your brand and what they see, and 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 you can see what they're searching for, this is powerful evidence, right? This is a a, a marketing technology company. Uh, they do like workflow management, marketing resource management. Uh, I can see just by typing the subsequent letters that demo is a popular search. But when I search for demo, I don't actually find a demo. It's just an example of how uh, you can confirm that you have a piece of content for every one of your navigational queries and that there's more navigational queries than just your name of your business. A primo demo. Oh, they've got some videos, but none of them were called demo. Probably the... the um, Knowing that visitors are searching for this, it would be an opportunity to just uh, help them find what they're looking for faster. You, there are tools for this. KeywordTool.io is useful for this. They sort of scrape out of the Google Suggest everything that Google would have suggested if you typed the next letter of the alphabet 26 times. We did this before in the earlier course, but it's just an example of like, what do people think of when they think of you? Here I'm doing it specifically for the branded queries. So... It's useful. It's fun. It's fast. You can just get a sense for what, for what are you relevant for, right? Uh, and then you can just go look at those search results and just check. What do the site links show? Let's pay extra attention to those pages. Are there competitors bidding on your brand? Let's <laughs> hit back and maybe uh, consider uh, reaching out in a friendly way and declaring a truce and not bidding on each other's brands or, or just bid on their company as well. People also searched for what, what is the category, if that appears, that Google believes that you're in. Are there questions being asked? If so, you can answer those questions in your content or right there in your local listing. Uh, are there reputation issues? Very visible. Uh, you'll never really know if people are seeing that and then not going to your website. Uh, and then what are the other related searches? Uh, I've seen lots of examples of where this, this can make a big difference. So uh, it's worth uh, the five minutes of research. So these are my tips for branded search results page analysis. Search for every phrase. See what you see. Do you like it? Confirm you've got a page on each topic. Bid on competitors. They're bidding on you. Probably doesn't cost that much. And then maybe look at the people also ask box. Answer those in your in, in your, your business.google.com account. And then work on your reputation issues. Mostly what we're concerned about here 
is to maximize the percentage of your visitors who become leads, to maximize those conversion rates through adding answers to top questions and evidence to support those answers, and then clear, compelling, specific calls to action that make the benefit high and the cost seem low. In the next section of this Agency Growth Playbook course, uh, we're going to talk more about the search side of things, and I'm going to go into some, some details about uh, the best things that I know to improve uh, results from search uh, based on all of my years of experience, uh, starting with the, the high-level perspective on search ranking factors. So stay tuned. Uh, coming up next is uh, a deep dive into SEO. See you there.